Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We're glad you're listening today. This is a call-in show, and that means the show's about you. You give us a call. We talk about whatever you're interested in. You can call me. It's 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U Dot edu. Boy, I tell you, with this hot weather, <laughs> it, it is just putting a damper on a lot of folks for wanting to get out there and do some gardening. Apparently, it's not put a damper on emails. We've got a lot of emails today uh, to go over. Uh, but uh, give, feel free to give us a call. Let's talk about the things that are of interest to you. I'm going to start off by uh, heading out to the emails. And we had a question uh, from Chelsea about a cottonwood tree. And this tree uh, is a very large tree, uh, you know, like cottonwoods can become, but about 50% of the bark around the base of it is gone. And you can see on the edges where the bark that is living uh, past that area is starting to try to callus and crawl back in, cover back over that area. Uh, when a tree reaches a more mature age, its vigor is less than when it was young and actively growing and getting more size. At some point, it, it reaches a point where, depending on the soil, depending on the tree species and the soil moisture content and whatnot, it's kind of reached as large as it will reach. You may have noticed if you've ever traveled up to the northeast, uh, you know, you go up somewhere like uh, Vermont or Rhode Island or even, the trees are just huge. They are absolutely huge. And it's a very different climate up there than we have here. Uh, as as you go further and further west, uh, maybe you've also been to El Paso or, or someplace, uh, you notice the trees are pretty small. As you start getting into the arid west, they're typically not large unless they're growing along a creek. And when a tree reaches the age where it's kind of done what it can do considering the climate and soil conditions and the limits of its own genetics, uh, it, it isn't very vigorous. Why am I explaining all that? Well, uh, if it were a young tree and had a, maybe someone bumped it with a car bumper and had this big gash in the trunk where, you know, the bark died and it's now trying to close over, we would give it a good chance of closing over and, and with reasonable care. Uh, at this point, that is just too much area for it to close over. And the reason we say too much is the closing rate is really slow. Now, cottonwoods, the interior of the tree is wood that decays very easily and quickly. And so that tree will become rotted out in the center before the bark is able to close back over and protect that exposed inner wood from decay. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but in this case, I think that tree needs to come out. Uh, the further the problem progresses, the more dangerous it is uh, to be exposed to a storm, for example, uh, the more difficult it is to have someone climb up in there and, and take it down from the top down. Uh, it's more of a risk. So uh, I would say sooner rather than later. Uh, it's, it doesn't look like a tree that would fall tomorrow, but you know what? A tree that looks perfectly healthy could fall tomorrow. And so, you know, the right storm and things going on, we don't see inside it. So there's no guarantees here. Uh, I would just say that uh, the future is not there for this tree. And if you go ahead and get it out, you can plant something else that could grow and become a nice, beautiful tree for you. Uh, and so, again, being the bearer of uh, bad news, Chelsea, uh, I would say just uh, let's just go ahead and get that get that thing out. You can have a certified arborist come look at it, someone trained and knows what they're doing. Uh, take a look at it and see what they think to get a second opinion if you like. But I would be very surprised if they give that tree any kind of a hopeful prognosis uh, based on what I'm seeing there in the pictures. I had another question come in from Shannon. And uh, Shannon 
uh, has sent a picture of a sweet potato, an uh, organic sweet potato they purchased last month, and now there's all these shoots coming out of it. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, your sweet potatoes will sprout, and they'll send these little uh, etiolated shoots, meaning they're not getting sunlight, they're not developing good green color, they're just stretching looking for light. Uh, that's typical of something sprouting indoors. Uh, but if you uh, will get that out, I would first put it out in a brighter area. Maybe you can put it in a bed with a little bit of moist um, soil or something like that. Get it some light. Not Don't put it in direct sunlight immediately. That'll just fry those little tender shoots. Uh, but had it grown out there, it would already be green. But in the meantime, let's get it greening a little bit and then just break each of those off where they attach to the sweet potato. Sweet potatoes are incredibly easy to root. Uh, in fact, when it's planting season, they give cut-off shoots and bundles um, at, the, at the give. They sell cut-off shoots and bundles at the uh, you know, garden centers for you to take home. And you stick those shoots in the ground, and before they die, they root, which is pretty amazing. Uh, I, would, I would get these in a little better condition, you know, where they're turning green, they've got some green leaves, and then get them planted out. I mean, you can put them, if you want to go to great trouble, you can go put them in a four inch pot and and start to root them yourself but normally you should just be able to plant them out um, and uh, they get established and then they grow and they produce sweet potatoes now the caveat it's a little late for that uh, so for this particular potato if you wanted to just get them growing so that you would have something to replant next year uh, you could certainly do that uh, but sweet potatoes take a long time, about 120 days. They vary between cultivars for sure, uh, but they're about 120 days before they produce potatoes from planting. So if you were to say August 1st, let's see that September, October, November, that would be about December 1st, That uh, and then you won't have sweet potatoes. Once we hit into the late October and it's cooling off, they're not, they're not going to be producing much in the way of sweet potatoes. So... Uh, not enough time this year. If you want to do that again next year, uh, probably the easiest thing, Shannon, would be if I were doing it, I would just buy another one of those potatoes that you want uh, and then uh, maybe do that in uh, spring and get it growing, get some shoots growing. Typically, we'll put them in a bed of moist sand and the shoots will just come crawling out of the ground and you just break them off and take them out to the garden and plant them and they do, they do really well. Uh, sweet potatoes are something that likes hot weather. So if you plant them before, I don't know, I need to, need to check our chart. I think with sweet potatoes, we're probably probably looking at, what, uh, mid-April that we would put those in the ground. Uh, you could do it in April and May and even in June, but not in August. Hope that helps out a little bit. Uh, you can also buy just bundles of shoots from the garden center to do, as I mentioned earlier, but if you had one and you just, you know, for fun, wanted to try growing your own there, that's how you would do it. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689, or by email at Garden Success. Uh, and you can reach us at Garden Success at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Garden Success is one word. Garden Success at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. So we will do that. By the way, when you email me, uh, if I don't, uh, or typically I don't reply uh, to, to the emails. Uh, I try to answer them here on the air just because I'm working before the show and I'm working again after the show and I just don't have time to, to try to get to those. So what I do is I, I answer them on the air. So uh, you just have to listen in. If you miss your email getting answered, uh, you can just simply uh, go listen to a past show. Uh, the nice thing about um, the uh, Garden Success Show is you can listen to past shows online at the website, the uh, KAMUFM website, and uh, or you can listen if you have a podcast. Uh, there is a uh, number of podcast apps that you can use, and you just, you know, Check them out. Check out past shows. Uh, you can listen to Garden Success that way as well. Uh, I'm going to continue. We're going to go back to the emails now. I'm going to talk to or look at one from Scott. Scott planted a, um, a, a cedar tree 
uh, it's a cedar elm, excuse me, not cedar tree, cedar elm tree uh, in the yard, and is asking about the trashy trunk pruning system. And I'm going to go into that a little bit because this is something I think that uh, you will find helpful and interesting. First of all, Scott, you've done an awesome job mulching. Uh, there is a wide mulched area around that tree to keep the grass away, and that helps the tree have success. When you go to add mulch, by the way, Scott, just uh, add more mulch to the top and let the old mulch decompose. I read something the other day. Someone, who a uh, self-proclaimed horticulture expert, was saying, yeah, you get the old mulch out, clean it all out, and put fresh mulch in. Well, who does that in the forest? Not nobody. Have you ever seen a deer or a, or a bear with a rake in their hand bagging up the forest? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Uh, what happens in the forest is old organic matter gets covered by new organic matter and the old decomposes as each year a new crop of leaves falls to the ground and it just makes for the richest environment. Don't ever throw away old mulch. Just add new on the surface. That's how nature does it. And uh, I kind of went off on a tangent there with the question, but um, it, it is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine to hear people say you got to get rid of the old mulch. I hope you don't. So trashy trunks, what is that? Well, when a tree begins to grow, if you were to prune off every branch, let's say you buy a little tree, it's the size of a broom handle, you know, at the garden center and you plant it. Well, there's not one branch on that tree you buy that is permanent. They are all going to go away in time. Uh, the first true branch that will live for perpetuity for the life of that tree is going to be way overhead high. Because imagine, go we'll walk in your yard, walk in, look at any yard, and you see big trees. But the first branch is up well over your head high because as it comes out, it may sag down a little bit. And you don't want to bang your head when you're trying to mow the lawn. Uh, the first branch is up high. So every branch you buy when you buy a tree, unless you just buy one heck of a monster uh, that someone brings in and, you know, at, at quite an expense uh, to do that, uh, every branch that, that you purchase is not a permanent branch. Uh, it just doesn't, doesn't work that way. And so I, I would recommend that uh, instead of uh, trying to leave branches to grow, which ends up being taking away from the permanent parts of the tree, that you leave those side branches, but that you tip them. And we call that a trashy trunk. Now, this is not how everybody prunes a tree. Uh, so I, you're getting my opinion, and I've, I've seen it work. We do it typically with uh, pecan orchards, pecan trees out there. Uh, you let those little branches grow, but then when you cut the end of them, that may be the last foot of the branch out when it's starting to grow out, uh, it dwarfs that. It, it means that that branch, you still have the leaves on the branch, those trashy trunk branches, uh, but they're not going to become the big branches of the tree. It, it dwarfs them. So if you were to, let's say, leave one branch, you didn't prune it all year, the other branch, you prune it, the tips out a couple of times during the summer. All the leaves on those shoots you pruned are producing carbohydrates that are feeding the tree that are helping develop a stronger root system. But uh, at the end of that season, unlike the unpruned branch, that branch stays small. And it doesn't take energy that would have been used in producing let's say, permanent wood, permanent trunk, permanent branches up above, uh, it doesn't take away from those. That's what a trashy trunk is. It's just doing that. Then at the, when the winter season comes, you cut those off where they join the branch. Uh, when a branch hits about the size of your thumb, a man, let's think of a man's thumb, about an inch in diameter, it needs to come off. It can come off before then, but uh, don't leave them up to where they're golf ball size and larger. That just makes a bigger wound. Uh, but the trashy trunk can help uh, because think about this, all those leaves, if you were to prune every branch and just leave the top of the trunk sticking up, well, you would have removed probably 90% of the leaves, leaf area of that tree. Uh, and this way you keep the leaves, you get them working for you, but you direct the growth, the uninhibited meaning untipped pruned growth into the trunk going up and then when it hits a certain point any side branches that are truly going to be permanent limbs. 
that's how that works. Now, I hope that description made sense. You know, describing something on the radio sometimes is a little bit difficult uh, to get what you picture. But I think you know what we're talking about. And Scott certainly does. He's got the plant there that he took the picture of. A real nice plant. Good choice, by the way. Cedar elm is an excellent, very resilient tree, uh, native to the area. And it just, you know, you'll go out in the pasture areas, even a black clay soil and other kind of challenging environments. And you'll see cedar elm that are just doing really well out there. Uh, they can survive. They can go through the kind of droughts we're having. Uh, not that drought can't kill a cedar elm. It's just they're resilient, a good, good choice and a good plant to do. The only drawback on all elms, in my opinion, from a landscaping standpoint, is they produce seeds. And those seeds come up. So you have little elm seedlings coming up all over. A lot of plants do that uh, in nature. Uh, but that just something to think about. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 979-845-5689. Or if you want to give us a, um, uh, let's see, an email, it's gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. And both of these I just talked about today. Uh, Chelsea's Cottonwood, Shannon's, or Scott's uh, Trashy Trunk, Tree, uh, Elm. The, those are I couldn't have done those without seeing the picture. Now that I see the picture, I know exactly what to tell you. And that's the advantage of being able to email is, is being able to send, uh, send a picture uh, along with it. I think that's really important. Uh, let's see, what are we going to talk about now? I, wanna, I want to uh, mention something going on in the community. Uh, the Native Plant Society of Texas uh, is having their forest bathing seminar with Dr. Rhonda Richardson, on August the 3rd, which is today, right? August the 3rd, Thursday, at Lick Creek Park Visitor Center, and it's at 6.30 p.m., and this is free. Now, the meet and greet with refreshments starts at 6. I would encourage you to go there. And, uh, in fact, uh, n n interesting side note, next week and the week after, I'm going to be out, and we're going to have some pre-recorded shows that you definitely need to hear there. Excellent guests that we have in. Next week, uh, we have someone from Texas Forest Service coming in, uh, and Morgan, and uh, she's going to talk about all kinds of things related to trees, where are my trees dying, how do trees live in their natural environment, uh, and a lot of the things the Forest Service, a lot of the services and things the Forest Service uh, can do. Uh, we mentioned on that show, because I've already pre-taped it, uh, we mentioned this program that's going on. And at, again, 6 o'clock tonight, 6.30, actual presentation. 6 o'clock is meet and greet uh, at the Gary Halter Nature Center at Lake Creek Park. For those of you new to the area, you just head out Rock Prairie Road, which is in South College Station, to the east of Highway 6, and it'll lead you out there to the Lick Creek Park and College Station. So this forest bathing thing, uh, it, it is a, a Japanese tradition, and it is really reaching other areas of the world, including uh, here in the U.S. now, uh, and it's the whole idea about boosting your mental and physical well-being naturally. And there is a lot, this isn't just uh, you know, like touchy-feely or people speculating. This is science-based truth. Uh, this is stuff that many, many studies have talked about the benefits of human interaction with plants and have actually quantified it. Uh, the, the effect on your blood pressure, for example, the effect on your mental well-being, and on and on and on down the line. Dr. Rhonda Richardson, uh, with the uh, with the, she'll be discussing the Association of Nature and Forest Therapies Guided Walks. Lots of good information uh, that you can learn there. I hope you take advantage of that. By the way, the following week, uh, we're going to have Dr. Tim Hartman here for the show. And Tim's going to be vi is visiting with me about uh, things that are fruit that are not so common. You know, you know what an apple and a pear and a peach and a plum are, right? There's a lot of other kinds of fruit. Some of them do well here. Some of them not so much. Uh, and uh, the horticulture department... Uh, has been doing studies on fruit for many, many years. And more recently, a lot of the fruit that, uh, you know, we haven't looked at in a while are now being brought back in. And we're researching, we're planting, we're trying new varieties. We're looking at, do they do well here? What are the challenges with them? How do you have success with them if they have a, a, a chance of doing well here? And that's a program you don't want to miss either. And that'll be two Thursdays from now uh, as well. 
Uh, let's see. We're going to go back to the uh, emails. Uh, and Anne asked a question uh, about uh, planting seeds uh, indoors. Now we have the we have the fall vegetable garden well the vegetable garden planting chart uh, and all the dates. Uh, it's something I put together. It's it's a green checkerboard looking chart. And if you go to the Master Gardener website here in Harris County, Harris Brazos County, uh, the uh, Brazos M G dot com brazosmg.com you can find on there the edible section and there the vegetable garden planting dates for brazos county it's free download you can look it on your computer you can download and print it if you want and it tells you when to put things out and it'll say on there plant this by seeds or this is better started as a transplant Anne's question is uh, how do you know when to plant your transplants indoors uh, to get them going uh, and they do need time uh, to grow. And I'm going to give some general, a general answer, uh, some general answers to that question uh, for Anne and for any of you that are curious about that. In the cool season, when and let's say it's January and you're wanting to have tomatoes and peppers and things when the last freeze frost dates are passed and it's time to plant those things, we would start in about six to eight weeks ahead of time before the last average frost date in the area. And if you get that uh, vegetable chart that I just told you, it has exactly a little thing at the bottom showing when the last average spring frost is and when the last average fall frost is. Now, average. <laughs> what does average mean? Average means that that date is almost never the date when the last frost or freeze occurs. It's the average date. Some years earlier, some years later, a few years much earlier, a few years much later. Uh, but in general, that's kind of what we aim for. We, we are not in charge of the vicissitudes of nature, and so we have to, we have to go for what's average uh, as we aim for that. So you want to go six to eight weeks before that to plant something like a tomato or a pepper. I will often start them in the spring earlier than that. Uh, Sometime way into January, early January even, I will start planting a tomato. Now that's really, really early because they're not going to go out in the ground until about mid-March. Uh, but uh, you can get them growing and then you can bump them up to maybe even a gallon size pot. Uh, and by the time it's time to plant them, you have a little plant that already has blooms, maybe even a few set fruit on it. Uh, and you can put it out in the ground and get a head start. That's up to you as to how early you start. But just know that planting at the right time is important. And so if you want to plant a tomato in the spring, a traditional tomato time, I'm just using tomato as an example, uh, they're going to start going out in the ground about the second or third week of March. And by the time you get to the middle of April, you need to have gotten them in the ground for best results. So count back six to eight weeks. Now when we go into the fall, uh, we're not starting those seedlings indoors so much. Uh, we can for a little bit. But indoors, the lighting just isn't great. Now, if you have a nice lighting set for your transplants, that's good. I highly recommend doing that if you want to start your own seedlings. Uh, but in the fall, we don't have to worry about it freezing outside when we're starting them. So I will often start mine indoors just to get them up and sprouted. And as they begin to come up, get them right away into nice, bright light, not direct sun. So you don't set that tray of seedlings out in the full sun to grow them. You put them in a spot, maybe under the eaves on the north side of the house or something like that, uh, where you have really bright light, but not the direct sun blazing down on them. Then as they begin to grow, you move them gradually into more and more light so that it becomes, when it becomes time, now that we're going to make, uh, let's say, broccoli our example for the fall. Uh, when it's time to plant broccoli, which is about mid-September on, on into maybe early November, uh, sooner, better than later, uh, you would have that thing ready to go when it's time to plant it. So I might start my broccoli about now. Uh, and broccoli would include, that would include Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, kale, kohlrabi, all of those blue-leafed cold crop vegetables. And again, when you see the chart, you know when to plant them out. Uh, and I would start them now. That would give them about six weeks, at least four weeks to get them going. So let's say mid-August, uh, for sure by then. If you started a little later, you would just plant a little bit later, uh, and it, it would be okay. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of what we aim for. Uh, if you can give a plant six weeks, that's great as a transplant. Uh, for most things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and in the fall, the cold crops, they all do well with about four to six weeks. If you're planting something in the cucurbit family, like a melon or a squash, 
uh, for example, we generally are looking about two weeks, maybe three weeks for those. When they get in a pot for too long, they do not like it at all. And so if you have a root bound, uh, let's say it's a yellow squash or a cucumber, they're not going to transplant and do as well. So you don't want to leave them as long. You can direct seed them out in the garden or you can start them as a transplant either way. Uh, but that's kind of how you would time that. So that's a long answer, Ann. Uh, but I hope uh, in the process of answering, we provided some other helpful information. Let's go to the phones now. Our phone number, 845-5689. And we're going to talk to Ron. Hello, Ron. Good morning or good afternoon now. Good. How you doing? I'm well, thank you. Uh, so if uh, if I haven't fertilized my lawn since spring and I have the ability to, to water it, the, the lawn, would mm-hmm. you... Uh, what's your take on fertilizing the lawn right now? Uh, there's nothing wrong with fertilizing now, but if your lawn is under drought stress, it's just not going to be able to respond to fertilizer. And you definitely don't want to use a weed and feed, and you don't want to overdo the fertilizer, especially if it's a salt-based synthetic fertilizer. You can burn the lawn. It's already drought stressed, and now you're putting a uh, a, a salt down and and with the limited water it becomes a concentrated salt and you can burn a lawn with that but aside from all those uh, misapplications uh, you can fertilize now you just are going to have to be able to water your lawn for it to take advantage of it okay oh your is your, right, ha, ha, how's your how's your lawn looking uh you know i'm overall i mean is it is it pretty green uh is it got vigor uh, yeah, it, it, uh, I, I, I'm able to water with well, well water, uh, but it looks it looks pretty good. There's some areas I have a sprinkler system. There's some areas of, of uh, stress, but for the most part, it looks good, and I'm cutting it every five days right now. So, okay. Uh, are, are you returning those clippings I, when you mow? I am. Okay. Yes, I do. Well. And, and with some moisture in the clippings, you're getting a nutrient release there all through the summertime. And so there is an ongoing decomposition and release of nutrients out of those clippings that actually is pretty significant. Uh, years ago, uh, one of our turf specialists, Dr. Dubel, uh, did some studies where they looked at the value, nutrient content of clippings and what it would amount to. And, and it's, it's significant, uh, the amount of nutrient in them. So uh, if you wanted to hold off and just do maybe a a fall application of fertilizer, the one where we prepare our grass going into winter to come out strong in the spring, uh, that would also be okay to wait until that one. And that one's going to occur probably, we're looking at uh, probably uh, very early October. Okay, well, I think you've convinced me to hold off. All right. Well, good. Either way, you know, there's not one way to skin a cat when it comes to the lawn. And we just try to kind of stay within the realm of of what makes sense and has some scientific background to it. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you for the call. I appreciate that, Ron. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 845 5689 or by email at garden success at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, i had a nice phone call from lou uh and uh, uh let's see lou is asking questions uh about a tree that would fill a 20-foot space there's about 20 feet between uh, the house and the street uh, and about 50 feet long area, so about 20 by 50, and they'd like to plant a tree or two out there that would be nice. And the question was about crepe myrtles or maybe cypress trees to fit into the space. Well, cypress gets really huge over time, so I would not put a cypress in that amount of area. Crepe myrtles would be a good one for that amount of area. Uh, There are some crepe myrtles that stay small. There's crepe myrtles that only get three feet tall, for crying out loud. There's a lot of them that get really tall. Uh, Then some like uh, Natchez, which is a beautiful crepe myrtle. It's white flowers, but it has a kind of a rusty red exfoliating bark. It's real attractive. I think it's really attractive. It'll get up to 30 feet tall. Uh, and so I would probably do something like a Natchez crepe myrtle. It's also resistant to powdery mildew. Uh, the only thing with crepe myrtles here is we do have the crepe myrtle bark scale, and that's an issue we have to deal with. 
Uh, but uh, that would be a good choice for there. Another one that would probably be okay for that area is the uh, Chinese fringe tree. Now there's a native fringe tree. The folks call them the Grancy Graybeard, the native fringe tree. Uh, it's not as showy as the Chinese fringe tree, but it is an option uh, that you could use if you want a native plant. Chinese fringe has a, a more prominent white shaggy flowers in the spring. And it doesn't get that large. It'll take it a while before it fills up that 20-foot space. Uh, and so you could certainly, with a little bit of pruning, train the limbs up a little bit. And then you'd have a nice little tree. Uh, it The flowers are, are, are lightly fragrant as well in the spring. Uh, if you want to see what a Chinese fringe looks like, if you go out to the Master Gardener's demonstration garden in North Bryan on Highway 21, it's almost all the way out to where 2818 goes around town. Uh, it's out there, and there's one in the garden, and it's just a beautiful one. You'll know it when you see it. It's the only little tree that's actually in the garden itself. Uh, very beautiful. A nice choice. So there's a couple of options for you uh, that uh, would be uh, probably a good idea. Uh, a lot of other things are just going to get too big in time, and so... Uh, there are a few others we could we could suggest or recommend. I think that's probably the one that is going to be the best fit because you're going to want something that grows kind of quickly, um, at least moderately quickly, and that doesn't get too terribly tall. So that would be a couple of options that hopefully would be helpful for you. Well, our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845 5689 or by email at garden success at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, we had a question uh, came in from email from John uh, and John is asking about the first crop of little tiny acorns that you see uh, that come on the trees earlier in the season and um, so the, the little acorns, uh, oaks are one of the tree species that has a wind-blown pollen and they produce separate male and female plant parts. So a pecan is another example. So the, the pollen catkins, the little long kind of pipe cleaner like things sticking out there, uh, if I, uh, that's, I guess, a fairly close description of what they look like. Uh, they, they shed the pollen, and then you have separately uh, on the plant, different location than that catkin, uh, there's a bud that produces a little female uh, uh, structure that can receive the pollen and that would form the acorn, or in the case of pecans, the pecan nut. And uh, so whenever you see acorns, those are the female structures that receive the pollen, the windblown pollen. And so that's, uh, that's how that works. And, uh, you know, pecans tend to bear every year, but they tend to bear alternately, meaning you get a real heavy crop. And as a result of a heavy crop, you don't have a heavy crop next year. So next year's kind of an off year. And then the following year, because it was an off year the year before, you get a heavy crop. And it's all about carbohydrates uh, in the tree. So the leaves are making carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are essential for making fruits and nuts. That just has to happen. They're needed for, for plant growth and vigor and health and everything. But when you have a crop that ripens late in the year, like a pecan, uh, you know, right now, those pecans are sending a lot of carbohydrates into the nuts that are on the tree to create all that pecan kernel that you would want or that most likely your squirrels will have for a shot at. Uh, but those pecan kernels are like a sink for carbohydrates to flow into to produce that. So instead of setting buds for next year to have a good crop, it goes into this year's crop. And then next year, when there's no crop to compete with, uh, lots of carbohydrates for a real heavy uh, set of the tree. Now I'm talking about pecans. The question was about about acorns, but it, it, the principle is the same of what we're talking about. Uh, so that is just something we see. Some acorns, uh, some oaks uh, produce acorns every year, some every other year, or even other schedules like that. Uh, they can vary a little bit uh, in, depending on the, the specific species that we're dealing with. 
Uh, John also had a question about Dallas grass heads coming up now in the lawn areas. And does it do any good to cut the heads off? And the answer is really no, other than it takes the seeds on those heads away, especially if you cut them and drop them, well, that didn't help much. But if you, you cut them and bag them and get them out of there, that, that can be uh, very helpful. Uh, so uh, John's cutting about every four to five days. So that that's a pretty good schedule uh, that you would have. Uh, so does it help to do that? Yeah, you're cutting down on, on the seed uh, production as well. The thing to remember about any weed in the lawn uh, is that when your lawn gets dense, weed seeds have trouble coming up because they don't get light. Le seedlings need light. And that's true of that tomato seedling you're growing in January and February to, to plant in the spring. If you don't have good light, you're not going to have a good tomato plant. It's not going to survive. Uh, so out in the lawn, uh, our goal is to make as dense of a lawn as we can. And how do we do that? Mow, water, fertilize. Three steps. Real easy. Mow as often as you can. The more often you mow, the denser, more beautiful the lawn. Mow at a decent height so that you have some height to the grass. To try to make St. Augustine a golf green is a mistake. It's not going to work. It's not going to do well. Uh, so give it a good height. With St. Augustine, I would say about two and a half, three inches high. Uh, is where I would prune, probably two and a half uh, on St. Augustine. You can go a little lower, but in general. But the more often you mow, the denser it is. Watering with a deep soaking infrequently. If you're squirting your lawn every day, every other day with a little bit of water, you are not doing it any good. In fact, you're doing harm and you're wasting water. And because when you get through watering, for let's say you put a quarter of an inch of water down, you've wet the grass blades, you've wet the thatch, and you have not wet the soil, hardly at all. Uh, so right after the water goes off, it all evaporates, and you have contributed to the humidity of Bryan College Station. Thank you very much. Uh, and so instead of getting benefit from the drinking water you paid for to put on your lawn, you are not. In fact, you probably are increasing disease problems because every time we wet plant foliage, we increase the incidence of certain diseases that can attack that plant. So a good soaking on an infrequent basis, and then finally fertilizing. Fertilizing drives vigor of, of growth of the plant along with the water. And so when you create a dense lawn over time, you grow yourself out of most weed problems. There are a few weeds that are perennial that can coexist in even a dense St. Augustine or Zoysia or Bermuda grass lawn, but those are the exceptions. And so what we try to do is get everything else out of the way and just deal with the exceptions. So that's it. That's what I would recommend. You can treat uh, also with a pre-emerge herbicide. Now, Dallas grass is a warm season weed. And so like other warm season weeds, uh, about the time we get into mid-February, you need to put down something that is a pre-emergent, meaning it prevents the weed seeds from emerging and establishing plants. So if they try to come up, it kills them before they establish plants. And, and you would do that in mid-February for next year's crop of warm season weeds. And then for the fall, for the cool season weeds, you would need to do that uh, in late September. Get those down, get follow the label, get them watered in to prevent that. But our goal in the lawns is not to be on a treadmill where we're applying herbicides twice a year for pre-emergent, and then we're applying post-emergence as well to kill the ones we didn't get. Our goal is to develop a dense lawn and work ourselves out of the herbicide business as much and as fast as we can. And so I'm spending a lot of time on that. I realize, uh, John, and for those of you who are listening to this, but I want you to understand how that works because, you know, it's easy to just say, oh, you got Dallas grass. Go buy this herbicide, put it on in this time, and this is how you get rid of it. Well, that that's part of the treadmill approach. Uh, we certainly use those, and they will help us until we get a good, dense, health, healthy lawn. So, for example, if you're listening uh, and your lawn is not thick, it's not dense, uh, drought is hammering it, taking the toll. Maybe you've got take all root rot in there. It's also affecting it and other things. Well, when it comes time late September, you, you need to put down a pre-emergent or you're going to have a lot of cool season weeds like annual rye, annual rye, uh, I mean, sorry, annual bluegrass. Uh, well, and there's some rye too, but uh, chickweed, carpet weed, um, uh, cling, uh, cleavers, which is, is uh, also called carpet weed, henbit, clover, those kinds of things. Uh, in, a, in a lawn that's thin, that's what you're going to have. Because you know what? Nature 
hates to have uh, a gash on the landscape. It hates to have a bare spot in the ground. It hates to leave the soil bare where it can wash away and crust and everything else. So wherever the sunlight hits the soil, nature plants a weed. That's a good way to think about it. Uh, and so your goal as a lawn care person uh, who wants to have the beautiful lawn, the show place, uh, your goal is to not let the sunlight hit the soil. That's the number one thing you can do to fight weed problems. And then the ones that escape, you know, we can we can deal with those and talk about those. Well, let's see, guys, we got a, we got an option today. Uh, I can talk the whole time <laughs> or we can talk to you about what you're interested in. I'm happy with either way, so <laughs> you choose. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Edu. Now, I want to tell you about something going on in town out at Messina Hoff Winery. Messina Hoff is having their Harvest Festival 2023. You can go to their website, Messina Hoff, M E S S I N A H O F dot com, or uh, excuse me, dot com, and then find the Harvest Festival, or if you just want to add to that, slash harvest dash festival takes you right there. Each of the weekends in August, they have a family-friendly uh, activities going on at the Estate Winery in Bryan. Uh, they celebrate that annual Harvest Festival every year. It's a favorite opportunity for you to connect with friends, for them to connect with you as well, uh, and for Texas wine lovers uh, to get together. They uh, go through their Harvest Festival at this time of the year, and they are picking and stomping the very grapes that go into making Messina's Hoff's award-winning port wines. Uh, they offer a range of daytime and evening events during that time. So here's what I'm talking about. On Friday, August 4th, that would be tomorrow, is the Moonlit Harvest Number 1. And from 7.30 p.m. to 10 p.m., nice to be out that time of day as opposed to in the afternoon, uh, they have an event that includes, includes the Blessing of the Vine and the official kickoff event for Harvest Festival. And you get to go out there and you can take part. Uh, you get to pick, uh, harvest, uh, you get to harvest the grapes uh, for them, with them, uh, and help stomp the grapes as well. Uh, in fact, I saw a cool t-shirt. It's like, a, it's the Harvest Festival and you take your foot prints that are wine or grape juice stained and stomp on the t-shirt and now you've got your own little souvenir there from having taken part in that. On Saturday, to, day after tomorrow, August 5th, is the daytime harvest and this one, this is the first one, it'll be at 9 a.m. in the morning till 11.30 a.m. So you can do the Friday night moonlit, you can do the daytime harvest at 9 a.m. Uh, and then going on through the uh, the the month of August, it's it just goes on. On August 11th, Friday is a moonlit, and on August 12th is the daytime. And then the 19th, and the 25th, and the 26th. There's a lot of opportunities to get out there and get part of it. Be part of it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And it just, just, how many of you have had the chance, other than watching I Love Lucy, where she and Ethel stomped through the grape vault. Some of you don't even know what I Love Lucy is. Uh, how many of you had the chance to actually stomp grapes and have fun with that? <laughs> Producer asked. All right. Well, we're going to go to the phones now. Apparently, uh, you guys decided you didn't want to hear me drone on. We're going to talk to Weta first. So, Weta, how are you today and how can we help? I love to eat wild persimmon fruit. Okay. And I planted several seeds in my yard and they've come up but I've heard that there's a different you need male and female and I have one tree that has some some flowers on it but I don't know whether it's male or female you should have both on the tree or you should have uh, some have perfect uh, flowers I'm trying to remember now about persimmons. I guess we need a, two weeks from now. I'm going to have Tim, Dr. Tim Hartman on. We're going to talk about persimmons and other fruit. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that. If you have wild trees and you planted several, you should be okay. It should be just fine. Uh, it takes them a while from seed to reach maturity stage where you can harvest them. So it's going to take a few years 
uh, and that varies with the genetics of the seed and the growing conditions there at your yard. Uh, but uh, you will eventually get those wild persimmons that you love so much. Do you need just one tree or are several going to help? One tree should do it. Several may also help. I'm trying to remember on the wild persimmon, the Diasporus virginiana, if... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to look at that to be a little more specific. I know we have persimmons, especially the Asian persimmons, that will set fruit without pollinating. Uh, and then they can also self, self set fruit if they are pollinated. I'm trying to remember on the native wild persimmon, I don't think you have to have more than one tree to produce fruit. But I could be wrong about that. Now, did you say something about two weeks? You're going to have a... a Yes. Talk about that. Yes. The show, uh, not next Thursday, but the Thursday after, Dr. Hartman is going to come in. And we're going to talk about all kinds of fruit that is not so common, like persimmons. You know, not everybody has a persimmon tree uh, in their yard. Uh, and uh, some of the other fruit that's not really common that people are interested in trying to grow and discuss whether you can grow it or not, what are the challenges and so on. But yeah, persimmons are great. I mean, they are that is just a, it, I love persimmons, as obviously you do too. Uh, and uh, they're ornamental in the fall when you have the fruit hanging on the tree and the leaves are turning pretty colors. So it's lots of reasons to have a persimmon tree. I love it. Do you, do you bake with them? Do you make persimmon bread and other things? Oh, I just eat them fresh. Oh, you eat them fresh? I bet you know how to wait until they're not astringent, though. Oh, yes, I'm more than that. <laughs> That's a short learning curve, isn't it? <laughs> when you bite into a astringent persimmon, wow. <laughs> well, I, that's, uh, I would suggest listening in a couple of weeks here, and I'm going to try to find out. Uh, if I figure it out before the end of the show or something, I may even mention it on the air. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Wida. Let's go to the phones now and talk to John. And by the way, the phone number is 845-5689. Hello, John. Good afternoon. I, Mary wants to know if she can still plant some kind of a bush bean, or uh, and what species she she should plant. Even and should we put shade cloth over it or what? Yeah, and in fact, uh, I would say now's the time to start planting those. Uh, the second half of August is pretty good. If it's if it's truly a bush bean, uh, like a snap bean. Uh, I would do it from the second half of August up to even the first week of, Ju of September. Uh, if it's like a pole bean, those often take a little longer. So I might do that, you know, starting the second week of August and, and stopping by the end of August, just because they take a little more time to reach harvest. And we have this thing called frost that will eventually get here. Uh, as far as do you need to shade cloth them? No. But if you put a shade cloth over the row, the the sun baking down the soil just doesn't get so blazing hot and it's easier on the tender seedlings uh, and they'll do better. But a lot of people plant them without that. Uh, but I would, if you have access to it, I would do that. Okay. Well, that's good. I'll get her fired up on it then. There you go. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for the call. Appreciate that very much. Our phone number is 979 845-5689. 845-56- 89, uh, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Gardensuccess at tamu.edu. I'm going to go back to John's question about the Dallas grass, uh, just kind of looking over that question a little more closely. He is also asking, uh, is there something you can spray in the spring to control them? Of course, that's the pre-emergent I talked about. But he also mentions that in some areas, the Dallas grass is about the only thing you see growing. And if, if, you, if you don't have other desirable grass, you could spray that with a grass-only killer. There's a couple of product ingredients that will kill just grass and not broadleaves. Or you could spray it with something like a glyphosate that kills everything, the Roundup being the name everybody knows. Uh, and, and just go ahead and kill it and get it out of there now, and then hopefully to get some St. Augustine growing back in the area. But both of those kinds of products, if you spray them and get them on St. Augustine or zoysia or Bermuda grass, it'll kill them uh, as well. I believe, do we have someone else that's uh, waiting here on the line to get on? Excuse me. Uh, we need to talk to Ed now on the phones. Ed, how are you this afternoon? How can we help? Excellent. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm using a planning guide, a Brazos 
County Vegetable Planning Guide that's dated that was published in 2008. Okay. Has do you know if that guide has been revised uh, by it, any chance? It's been completely redone. Uh, so if you go to Brazos M G, like Master Gardener, dot yep, yep. dot com, Brazos M G dot com, click on there. Gardening in Central Texas is one of the button badges that's on there uh, and then click on edibles and uh, the, the uh, recommended varieties and the recommended planting chart will both be there and it's a nice green you'll know you're there when you see this big green January through December checkerboard chart of, of when Great. to plant what. Excellent. Yeah, you're at, is August 1 still a good date to start thinking about tomatoes, fall tomatoes? Well actually uh, it's getting a little bit late. I try to get all the tomatoes planted, you know, by uh, about now. Now would be, okay. I would think, kind of the end of the tomato planting time. You could go to mid-August, but you need to really be careful that you've got a fast variety. You know, something like brandy wine that takes maybe almost 80 days to harvest is not going to make it uh, in time. Okay. Uh, but celebrity is pretty fast. Anything that's about a 70-day, somewhere in that range, maybe 75 at the most, uh, you could probably still get those planted. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. You bet. Thank you for the call. I appreciate that. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. I had a question come in uh, from uh, Jeffrey, and uh, on a previous show, we had talked about a ground cover for an area with full sun and not to be watered or irrigated. Uh, Jeffrey has a different situation. It's it's a shady area. What's a good ground cover or grass for an area that's mainly shade, and uh, th and how to you know how to deal uh, deal with that? Um, so it looks like the soil quality is poor. Here we go again with all the specifications that just run just pretty much eliminate every option uh, that we have. But poor soil. Uh, hadn't been improved, uh, d doesn't, uh, does not need much water. They don't water very often, so it has to be able to survive without it. So in, in shade, St. Augustine is your best grass. And in shade, St. Augustine does not need much water. The shade that I see in your photos is, is very bright and dappled, and I think St. Augustine would do well if you can get it established well in that area. It's also a mostly a deciduous shade. It looks like you may have an oak tree or two. That, those are more challenging areas. Uh, but that would be the grass. And again, even though in the sun, you got to water it a lot in the shade. I've had areas in summer here in, Tex in this part of Texas where in sh deep shade, I watered my St. Augustine twice all summer. And so that's super, super low. Now, you know, it, you could water more, but uh, that's low. If, if you're going into a shady area and you're looking for a ground cover, we have some really good sedges, n uh, native sedges. There's a number of species that will do really well here. And they will do okay. They don't want to be completely dry. They need to have some soil moisture to do well, but they'll do pretty well here. So that would be another option that you might consider in, in a shady area. And then there are some other ground covers too, uh, just knowing a little bit more about, you know, what you're wanting out of the area. And it's also a very valid thing to, you know, have a bark mulched areas to, to do other kinds of landscape plant shrubs and things in those areas uh, that you might find uh, that do really well that are aesthetically are, are pleasing to you. Let's uh, head back to the phones. Our phone number 845-5689. We're going to talk to Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer. Hey, Skip, can you hear me? I can, and I can hear it's okay, that good. it's that Jennifer. Yeah, <laughs> it's the Jennifer, Jennifer yeah. water expert, Jennifer. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Good. It would be better if, uh, if people used less water, but... Uh, <laughs> well, let's make everybody yeah. happy and just go ahead and get a rain dance going here. If you can figure one out, no I'll do it with kidding. you. No <laughs> kidding. I, I think that if everybody, if you water, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but... Uh, you know, if your address ends in even numbers, if you water on Tuesday, Saturday, and if your address ends in odd numbers, if you water on Wednesday, Sunday, maybe that will get the rain dance going. Will that do it? Well, let's do one thing just to make sure it rains, and we'll all leave the windows on our car down. How about that? 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just just chiming in to to say that water demand is uh, really really creeping up. So um, attention, you know, it, and it's been getting hotter. But yeah, I'm just continuing my drumbeat of please don't water more than two days per week. Please don't water in the middle of the day. And mm-hmm. yeah, try to get um, try to get water demand down. It's, and also it's good advice. Um, yeah. And if anybody has plants that they have lost in the past uh, couple of years, um, we're doing another rooted-in plant sale. Um, I think I've mentioned it on your program before, and I can send you some, an email about that. But that's the, the garden in a box thing. Mm-hmm. And so September 23rd is going to be the pickup date, and you can get a pollinator garden or a shade garden. And okay. they're just $80, and I've... I got one a couple of years ago, and it is still going strong even in this heat and drought. My little pollinator garden. Wonderful, uh, and yeah. And so, um, if people want to do that, they go to your website to sign up. Delivery is September twenty third, but but they go right. ahead and pre order. So how how do they? Where do they go to to be able to pre order? So they just I, I need to put a link on my website directing them to okay. the Rooted In website, but they would go to rootedin dot com click and then go to the shop section and then when you add the box to your cart that's when you select your pickup location and you'll pick you'll select the gary halter nature center as your pickup location okay gary halter okay out at lick creek park okay Mm -hmm. yeah all right that sounds like a good plan yeah i'm still watering my grass even in the sun just once a week uh you know if as we teach our lawns with a good soaking followed by a drying out they become pretty darn resilient. And uh, I know people that were going to want to water twice a week, but I'm just saying it's not necessary. If you if you want to cut back a little bit more, you can sure do it. You know, I noticed that I have a section of uh, one of my, uh, a section in my uh, front yard where one of the sprinklers got kind of clogged last summer and the grass just, you know, it just completely died. But then um, I didn't re and as I've been watering and as we had rain this year, it did start to come back. Hmm. So even though, you know, people have said, oh, well, I couldn't water every day last year and my grass died. Yeah. It, it will come back. Yeah. So, well, yeah. you know, you know, something I noticed this year, too, early on, we, you know, the heat hit way too early, uh, the 100 degrees yeah. and stuff. And but even in that, I I didn't water for a long time into that. And, and I think we just had a lot of a bank account of moisture in the soil that was helping us go get by. And now it's just been so long that from trees and mm-hmm. everything else, that moisture bank account is getting depleted. And so now we kind of are dependent on some watering uh, to keep things yeah. going. All right. Well, thank hey, you. thank you for the call. I appreciate that. Boy, the end of the show just showed up on me and caught me off guard there. Uh, You're listening to Garden Success. Remember, we're available by podcast. You can listen to our show uh, on the uh, Garden, excuse me, the KEMU FM website. Uh, Next week, a special show on uh, trees and some of the things our trees are going through right now. Guest from the You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.